Okay, hi everybody. I'm going to try to explain something that is should be fairly easy to understand. Uh, and I apologize for my lack of vocabulary and um, language articulation. But I think my cat, my cat is like aiming at the times that I want to concentrate. <sighs> okay, uh, and this is for one of one of the a couple of the groups that I participate in Facebook regarding the Malvinas Falkland conflict, and ultimately speaking of truth and righteousness. Before I explain what I want to explain, um, it is perhaps essential and basic to understand that there is there are two uh, sides or two dimensions or aspects to the reality of the world and uh, human political and military history. There is the real reasons for why things happen, which later we often hear historians talk about in retro analysis, and I'm going to put my cat in the kitchen because I can't, which we often hear historians um, describe what the real motives or what really motivated something, and later we come to know it for how history books talk about it or how politicians describe their motives and reasons. Um, as two different, completely different, the real world is what actually motivated, what triggered the emotions and the reactions in in the people that later uh, ended up being being the ones that wrote history. So there's these two spheres of of, um, interpretation. The real one, which is not the one we talk about, basically. The one we talk about is the one that um, that people in a self-preserving interest often um, describe by um, sort of a narrative that is convenient to the invested interests and the powers that, that be. But then there is the sphere that is the actual fair and honest human analysis of why people in in, in the history of uh, of uh, of these events um, ended up doing the things they did. So that said, I'm going to explain something that is sort of fundamental and um, sort of like like the. Uh, how can I say this? The uh, the governing um, basis for on which to on which everything else uh, finds true validity and foundation uh, f- towards understanding and truth, and it is that mankind's um, our greatest gift our most our greatest capacity to um, to recognize truth and uh, pursue the utmost understanding and uh, comprehension of existence is our speech, our thinking, our thinking and our speech our communication skills, our ability to talk and reason. Um, It will always be closer to the truth about anything that you want to talk about in the history of the world and in the history of military affairs um, among nations uh, to understand according to reason and um, social, civil, political uh, comprehensions that had to do with with uh, principles and political philosophies, and um, you know, and so I sound like Sarah Palin. <laughs> okay. So what what happens? Okay, there's that. 
And then there is our ability to wield um, weapons, guns, armed force against one another. Communication and armed force are villain are the our enemies basically and it, it is because of our human nature to overpower or lose patience before um, the will of another now, our wills our wills push forward communication and understanding when the least as the the lesser aspect of our human nature starts rearing its head our community basically it has to do with no longer comprehending the logic and the reason in our communication or facing things that are uncomfortable or difficult to our personal morality or our sense of uh, recognition uh, self admission and self recognition um, and so communication stops in other words communication and talking speech goes forward and continues to uh, head towards the greatest truth uh, and the most eloquent reasoning of uh, comprehension towards ex our existence as long as it is on the up and up and it's always about the truth of all inclusive um, aspects of everybody involved as soon as we get into a personal situation that we have a hard time where our, our, our self-serving or our selfish or our ego aspects uh, find a challenge before perhaps admitting uh, we acted less than uh, nobly. <laughs> um, communication stops unless we're able to break through that and say it's true I was only thinking of myself or I don't have time for you or I didn't want to do that for that person because I don't feel that they deserve it or what have you if we can get through that uh, selfless that selfishness and and overcome our ego and we can continue to send forth communication and speech and continue on our uh, our um, attraction towards the ultimate greatest and most and superior reasoning what happens is that at the moment of challenge again the worst the lesser aspects of our nature uh, resort to avoidance resort to quitting the communication it's too difficult we want to step out when we invented weapons when we invented um, guns uh, to wield against the other our nature also had an instrument by which to enforce our willingness to create an obstacle in communication in other words our our desire to create an obstacle in communication so for example uh, you're talking to um, like typically like you're speaking to a police officer on the street and you're having a discussion. I don't know if, how many of you have ever done this, but um, you're talking about a situation and what was fair, what was just, about maybe somebody else, not necessarily concerning your own behavior. And at one point, or maybe, uh, let's say concerning your own behavior, you feel you did nothing wrong, and you're, you can see that there's no reason why the police officer has to stop you or um, there's nothing about the law that says he is uh, obliged to um, enforce the law against you and yet he resorts to stopping you by force this is a very common situation uh, in the world that everybody may be familiar with or we see in movies or we see on TV well it exemplifies precisely what happens in the greater picture communication will always lead towards truth will always take us to a broader understanding so as long as we can overcome where we may be not be right so if the officer has said true you're right um, I, I, I messed up I misinterpreted I was 
about to force you to do something that I had no right to do, and they shake hands and he walks away, which never happens, of course. Well, countries are kind of the same. The same thing happens. Um, weaponry and arms is what gets in the way of truth and justice, <laughs> believe it or not. And the funny part is that we say that um, we, you need a gun to secure the peace and all these ideas that seem to be proliferated by the NRA or something. Um, but in philosophical comprehension of existence, it is not true. It is always going, we're always going to be more eloquent and closer to the truth of about things through speech, communication, understanding, and reasoning. Um, and weapons or guns or armies are always going to be tempting to the one who does not uh, want to make that effort in overcoming the ego or is more uh, uh, desiring of his own selfish motives. Um, and therefore, what this basically concludes is that the most powerful, the ones that, you, the countries that most use their armies and their guns to settle matters, and this could be every anybody, a dictatorship, a, a constitutional nation that, that seems to, uh, that purports to use their army in a righteous way, it could be terrorism, any group, any organization, any nation that uh, most uses force to uh, you know to resolve matters to carry on for is uh, unavoidably the one that will be wronger <laughs> that will be more untrue about the reasons which could only be seen by discourse dialogue communication and reasoning so in other words, if you use weapons, if you use an army to settle a dispute, it is, um, it is um, unavoidable, unless, unless you're defending um, the, the onslaught of, a, of an ongoing advance. Of an, a, in other words, in the case of the Malvinas, for Britain to be right about uh, bringing war to the islands or having a military base on the islands today, it would have to be dealing with a country that has been relentlessly attacking the islands and Britain and constantly, so it had no choice but to defend itself. But it's actually the other way around. And there was a freak exceptional instance in which because of an military occupied, occupying dictatorship, that took over the country against the will of the Argentinians. This freak, uh, uh, and you know, um, take back of the islands occurred. In reality, uh, and this this is why Britain is very smart in how it uses force. It doesn't mean that it's more righteous or it's more correct in doing so. It's I'm proving exactly the opposite in what with um, explaining the opposite with what I'm saying. But Britain is very uh, a very experienced in knowing how to use military force so that it doesn't appear like it's enforcing uh, its will. But it knows very well for the 150 years that preceded the invasion of the, of, of the Junta, the Argentinians could not act on their, on their protest militarily because uh, it's it's a no it's a no brainer it's a, it's there's no contest there, there's the Britain the Brit the British were always a hundred times stronger than the Argentinians it, it, the idea was was of another world of another dimension they were actually friends because that possibility never existed so they did business they did the British uh, tried to dominate and and install its. Uh, its dominion of its industry and, and, and use Argentina economically and so forth. And so this, this conflict that was always there was never part of their relationship. But that is, uh, to a great extent, the ability, to, uh, the ability of Britain because it might as well have had a constant military presence because it was known. And it was the fact that it was known was just as good as uh, Britain being the aggressor. Be, Britain being the invasive 
power of the situation. It's not obvious. That's why this, this conflict is so interesting. Um, it's such a fascinating um, political, military situation because in reality, if you understand history, it is Britain that is the invasive power. It is trying to penetrate the Paraná in the 1800s to access, you know, it, it had to do with the war uh, between Chile and, and Bolivia. It tried to um, invade Buenos Aires and Uruguay. It, you know, it's always, it's actually the, of the two, it is the invasive power. But on the outside, and this is, this is going back to what I was saying in the beginning, on the outside, is not what, it is not what you see. On the outside, again, Britain is very good at creating a narrative that seems like, oh, they're just, you know, they're just doing what the, the proper thing, the legal thing. They're going by the book, <laughs> you know? And so it is very easy to create anti-Argentina propaganda because the Argentinians being impetus and more... Uh, the, the military junta being passionately crazed and stupid went and created an event that now makes Argentina all too easily describable by the British as the aggressor. And in reality it isn't. Because, and then you can actually look, you can actually find um, sim symptoms or dis you know, items that tell you Britain is the invasive uh, the uh, the one that abuses power and uses power to power is always an abuse. Military power is always an abuse. This is basically what I'm saying. The use of military force is always an abuse above reason, because reason will always be higher. Um, um, and so when you use military, and so, so what you see in Argentina today that is not training to invade the islands, never did, it never trained, it never prepared an army to, it just protested um, diplomatically at the United Nations. But Britain always measured its capacity, always was aware of the measure it was able to overcome the Argentinians' need be with that little garrison for a hundred and how many, for however long, it was all it needed to, you know, and, and, um, to uh, to discourage the Argentinians, but the Argentinians never even wanted to. It wasn't even a thought to uh, to, to confront uh, Britain. That's why the hypothesis that um, somehow uh, a covert operation, something, uh, information was sent to the junta to cajole their own delusional idea that maybe if. Be, seeing how things were were uh, were ha were um, were in the world at that time, maybe if they took the islands, nothing would come. Britain would not react militarily. There is no doubt. I am absolutely certain that the, they weren't that stupid. <laughs> you know, they probably bluffed and sent you know people out there because there were people from the military traveling to the states and traveling to Britain and there were reunions and buying weapons or whatever they were doing and I'm sure that they would come back with feedback to that would uh, uh, reassure or not or, or discourage depending on what information they came back with the junta from actually being able to being able to do this crazed uh, move and it seems very likely that um, the English and the American government seeing or the people in power or you know that the ones we don't always hear about in the news or know about are the heads of uh, you know more the more uh, <laughs> the other people we never hear about probably uh, were talking about what was happening with Argentina and Chile and how they were, um, the, what happened to Georgia and Sandwich, uh, South Sandwich Islands. Um, and if the junta did any kind of, sent any kind of feeler out there to see what the British uh, would do in such an event, um, I'm pretty certain that, you know, they, they made sure that the response was to reassure them that it most likely nothing would happen. Why? Because a war on the islands was the best thing that could have happened 
for that geopolitical uh, situation for Britain and for NATO. I mean, a war uh, on the islands assured that the islanders would all of a sudden wake up uh, and no longer feel that they could, they could just get by and be kept uh, kind of uh, standing in for Britain to keep the islands for them. But, you know, now they, they really felt they existed and they they more welcomed uh, British money and and they were proud before you couldn't really get islanders to say they were English or anything you know they were Falcon Islanders and now all of a sudden they don't say they're Falcon they say they're British all the time you know the war served them to, served to intimidate to create this idea of Argentina being the enemy country next door and so all of a sudden when you know you have an enemy next door you also like everything in life, when the potatoes are are boiling, oh, you jump into action, right? Uh, now that the uh, that's what that's what Britain needed. That's what the war served for. Now they uh, they um, anyways, and also um, you know because if it was just a matter of purely honoring the uh, the islanders and being kind and considered compassionate, uh, trying to keep, not scare them any more than they were already because of the junta. The British could have easily achieved the junta releasing the islands in, in, in order to not, uh, to, you know, to protect the, the islanders. It was more important for Britain. Uh, the islanders, the islands are more important to Britain than what Britain believe the islands are to the islanders. And that's pretty obvious because it, it wanted the war on the island. It could have done a whole number of things. If the islanders' well-being was the priority for, and this is what Britain says, right? That they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't have cared so much if it weren't for the, for the rights of the islanders to be protected and to feel, you know, all this stuff. In reality, they could have achieved the junta leaving the islands. They could have achieved a new type of administration territory for the islands that was better than the one they had before with Argentina involved. They could have achieved, they could have steered everything in, in ways. They had a whole bunch of, but you know, Britain knows how to work war. If there's something Britain has a lot of experience at is in what comes from war, what they can do with a war, how to, what to do with a victory, what happens to countries after they're defeated and so forth. And so that's what, that's, they've been, they can thrive through war. And it was, there's so many things that, that seem to say, um, you know, a war was more desired. <laughs> In fact, without thinking too much about it, if you asked, was war more decided by the Argentinians uh, than by the British, or was it more decided by the British, <laughs> hands down, England, Britain, of course they would want war more than what Argentina would want war on the, on the islands. So, so I don't understand why they're, it's so hard for uh, some of the people that argue this to, to get that. Um, but also if, if, the, um, if uh, the British had done something else, like maybe you know, bombed outside one some major city or some some military facility in Argentina. The Argentines would have been so freaked out. The military would have back it would have backfired on the military because now they were really going to be the the hated evil guys. Uh, see, if you think about it, it would have benefited. Um, it would have benefited much less the junta for Britain to. Uh, attack a, an, an Argentine military installation on the mainland in order to defend the islands and get them to release the islands. Uh, it would have benefited the junta a lot less than what it benefited them to make them seem like they fought and they, they hung on and they still were hated. They still, it still backfired, blew up in their faces. But the idea of, uh, of, of not warring on the islands and, and looking for another um, solution never compares to how effective it was for Britain to create a war on the islands. 
any other solution um, would have benefited uh, Argentina and would have not would have weakened um, domination of Britain of the of the of the Argentine economy by Britain. If if they didn't have a war on the islands and they didn't humiliate the Argentinians that way, um, the Argentinians would have been angrier against Britain. A peace accord would have been much more difficult and more uh, reluctant to be agreeable to the British after the war. The way by bringing the war on the islands, it they managed to uh, revamp the whole um, favorite nation sort of um, a, the Madrid Accord was, uh, was also and it's so weird because what does the Argentine economy and the privilege for Britain uh, to have uh, first dibs in the Argentine economy and all this stuff and, and do they really need to monitor everything that the, the Argentinians are not a military threat I mean, if we're talking about Japan or Germany, you know, yeah, but what need do they have for the Argentinians to tell them they're all, they want to dominate them. They want to, so the war was used to dominate the Argentinians, to dominate the war, the, the military activities, their economy, their everything. And it just seems so, so apparent that, um, that they almost made it happen. That they almost tempted the junta. Something happened that people, that has been swallowed up by history. But there's this whole void of people talking intelligently about the war, about the real values that are underneath the narrative, um, that seems to say it is, it is happening, this void is happening because truth is absent. The, the what this is the result when somebody you know when they steal from you how you're left confused when they break into your house it just you're left like in a cloud of limbo well if you think about the aftermath of the war sort of the subtle quiet low-key chaos this uh, inhibition and talking about the real motivating intelligent analysis of the war underneath the narrative you know the the victors uh, storyline that nobody you know basically as always Britain has in its hands the whole story of the of, uh, of the islands and the Argentinians are always left a little confused well you know there's a whole thing there's a whole oh boy a whole situation, a whole sort of colonial mentality thing that drags on from, from colonial days where um, Latin American countries were, were uh, sort of split after breaking, after gaining independence from Spain instead of building their own nations uh, like America did and like other countries did. Um, they um, you know, another colonial empire kind of stepped in that 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 space left by Spain, and so the Argentina and, and most Latin and all Latin American countries, they grew up not on a single footing of their own integrity and perspective, all around perspective of the rest of the world, but they grew up always with one half of them as such, seeing themselves as as where we're going, what we want, how we're going to do things here, and so forth. And the other half, always thinking of the Europeans, the Americans, the English, the French, you know, there's always this comparison. We do it like they do it in France, or, you know, or the Germans are this or this or that, the English are this, this or that, the French are this or that, you know. They're always, and so that, that is devastating to the progress of any country, because it's like if, if a country was a person, it needs to walk with two legs. And that's like saying one leg is, can't make up its mind who it's walking for while the other leg is trying to take the body forward. And this is a tragedy and it's something that Latin American leaders have always known it. And that's why uh, populist uh, um, nationalists government, you know, that, you know, against capitalism and all these uh, this other the left or what have you are such 
are, are not desired by uh, the powers uh, of, of, your, of, you know, of the world, of Europe, England, the United States, and because they're the ones that say, no, wait, we're not so sure that we want to buy that, or we're not so sure that we want to sell you that, or we're not so sure that we want to structure our economy according to, we can see that that is in your interest. You know, they don't like those people. And so they, they, they have Lula in prison and they, they malign all the ones that defend with patriotism their own nations like Korea and, and, um, and uh, the Bolivian guy, Morales, I think it is. <laughs> I can't remember now. And Kirchner and Mujica is the only one that got away with because he was so humble. You just couldn't, you, I guess they didn't have the heart to malign him. But, you know, they basically go after the ones that want to stand up for their own country. And so they prefer Macri. Uh, and Macri was, uh, saw this, but he doesn't care enough for his own country. He, he saw this and he knew very well that what would benefit his own economic invested interest was to play along uh what you know the, oh we don't we it's so stupid to care about malvinas you know it, it's such a thing what are we going to do with those islands you know it, you know it's such an insult such an offense to the country and people you know the argentinians don't even know what to say about it they're shocked they're always being shocked by the way they're being you know right hook left hook punched from left and right and and it's and, you know, anyways, and so it's just so unfair. You know, Latin American countries, they just need to be left in peace to order their own countries and stop pulling at their strings, stop trying to influence them. I mean, don't these countries have enough wealth? Have they not reaped enough benefit, enough resources from the planet that they will not, that they cannot let the young countries that need to find order and direction in peace? It's unbelievable. I mean, where, where, the, where do they want to go? It's not like you can continue growing and expanding onto another planet. This is it. If we don't learn to respect all nations as equal to our own rights as equal nations and have our own entitled right to develop our country for our own people, uh, it's just always, it's never going to stop. And if we continue to put weapons before reason and logic and truth uh there's all there's never it's never the fighting is never going to end <laughs> at some point we have to realize that the the enemy of human nature is the gun the enemy of truth the enemy of a superior sublime uh direction and and uh and and truth again is the army is the weapon we have to realize that human beings cannot handle gunpowder. We just don't know. We, we're like monkeys. We can't. We always end up destroying, hurting ourselves. We have to change the priorities. Uh, we, life did not design uh, <laughs> uh, a gun into our brain, but that is what you know they're teaching. They're equating war and guns and 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 murder to something that is sort of part of the human mind no the <laughs> the human mind uh, could never the species could never have survived and thrived and proliferated if its first thought was not love proliferating and thriving but we have seemed to have come to a point where we teach that somehow we were born with this fight of 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 equals between destroying guns wars and murder and love good and thriving as if they were side by side no there is an order and the first one is good love and proliferating thriving the enemy of that is the gun is the army <laughs> is the weapon and that will always be second and less desirable we seem to we knew that before we knew that before but um communication in the world is it's so incredible we have reached a time uh an amazing time of of instant the whole world can talk to itself through the internet through instant messaging uh all around the sphere and instead of seeing this incredible momentous uh epic 
uh, phase and, and human uh, as as something beautiful that needs to be respected and uh, hold ourselves back from it because we have to be very careful as to what we start saying to one another. We're teaching. We don't care. We don't. We anything gets. We continue to uh, disseminate in, in the same errors of logic and, and 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 we're making them worse instead of taking seizing the opportunity, rising to the occasion of communication to get truth, light, love, uh, thriving, healing, <laughs> life <laughs> uh, to. Uh, go forward abundantly and realize that our enemy has always been our own self-destructiveness. We can't seem to order that uh, correctly in this time of global communication. And we're still preoccupied with uh, who's richer, who dominates, who controls who, who censors what, who you know has power over who, and who gets out of the way. It's so tragic. The world is uh, just one big tragedy. And our most incredible moment, the day we finally started, uh, we acquired the capacity to look at ourselves as a world, as a humanity, and say, what do we need to do in order to no longer trip and start thriving and being and heal all our problems? Because now we can hear ourselves finally for the first time in human history. We just steamroll right over that and not even realize what the the, the amazing period uh, humanity is going through okay bye